Assalamualaikum khair. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Abraham Sleigh. I'm a neurosurgeon. And we are transmitting live from here from Amman, Jordan, at the Farah campus. And uh, the topic for tonight is uh, the butterfly glioma. And the backdrop is that pictures from Jurassic, which is the only complete uh, Roman uh, era town preserved, the only preserved city outside Rome. So, butterfly glioma. The definition is a glioma which has an image of invading the rostrum, the genome, the body, and the spleen of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is a midline structure, but the tumor is involving the parts of the corpus callosum along both sides. It's called uh, butterfly. Butterfly in the army and farash. They farash. It is the most aggressive form of JVM. Glioblastoma multiforme is very malignant. This is the most aggressive uh, malignant type. The reason is corpus callosum is made of tight fibers and it is resistant for invasion. So if it is invaded, this means that this tumor is very nasty. Like this. Tumor is involved in corpus callosum. Can involve the anterior part of the corpus callosum called the genome. Could be small, it could be large. Could be involving the central part of the corpus callosum called the body of corpus callosum. It could be taking the posterior part of the corpus callosum, which is called the spleen of the corpus callosum. And these are five cases of glioblastoma multiforme. Again, representing the facts which I mentioned. <coughs> So it could involve any part of the corpus callosum. These are my cases. They are really aggressive. This is uh, involving the spleen of the corpus callosum, which is the posterior part of the corpus callosum. <coughs> So what is corpus callosum? If we look at the interconnecting fibers, which is white matter, there are various types. Association fibers, commissural fibers, or projection fibers. Association fibers means fibers within the same hemisphere, right or left. Commissural fibers between right and left. Projection fibers between the brain and the spinal cord and the brain stem. So, Corpus callosum is one of the commercial fibers. Association fibers, as I said, within the same hemisphere. So within the right hemisphere or within the left hemisphere, various types, the ansonate, the inferior frontal occipital, the ansonate, the superior frontal, and so on and so forth. So either they are long, connecting, say, frontal lobe with occipital lobe, or they are short, connecting with the same uh, lobe. But the crucial fibers are connecting right and left, left and right. And the three main types of this are the corpus callosum, the anterior commissure, and the posterior commissure. Corpus callosum is a midline structure connecting right and left, right and left, like this. Fibers goes from one area to the other. Middle image. So superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus to middle frontal gyrus, occipital to occipital. Because this is a small or short, it's called forceps minor. This is long, it's called forceps major. So you can see this connecting right and left. And that's why we are, when I talk and my hands move, because there is a association between the right and left. If I don't have this, then my hand, right hand would move and the other one does not know what, what's going on. So this is the corpus callosum, connecting the left and right. Like that. <coughs> so this is the corpus callosum. It's made of rostrum, gyro, body. There's a narrowing here called desmos and spleen, anterior and posterior. So it looks like that. And even that, we can divide it into areas. And the rostrum 
The genome is made of two parts, superior and inferior. And then we have the posterior genome, and then we have the middle body, anterior and posterior, the isthmus and the spleen. So a neurosurgeon should be aware of this. And I tell you, if I ask this question in the uh, board exam, no one will answer it because no one knows anything about it. As if asking about the brain is a crime. So, anterior, posterior, this is the corpus callosum, the gene and the spleen, and above it immediately is something called cingulate gyrus. Why am I mentioning this? Because it has very much to do with the surgery that I'm going to talk about. It's called cingulate gyrus, or cingulum. So, this is the corpus callosum. Immediately above it is the cingulate. And it connects anterior, superior, etc. So it connects to the severe frontal gyrus, it connects to the cuneus, the pre cuneus, it connects down here, it connects backwards here. So this is the manifestation, this is the corpus callosum, the single light gyrus is made of the dorsal part and the ventral part. And it connects, as I said, with various uh, connections. Here, Posteriorly, at the spleen, it connects with the precuneus and the cuneus, which is the occipital area. So we are talking about brain networks. These are networks that are related to certain activities, including just listening. So if I'm talking, I'm doing a certain task, which is talking. And also, I'm moving my right hand. So I'm doing two tasks talking and moving my right hand. This is a specific task. This is motor, and this is speech area. If I'm at rest, we still are working. And there is a network which controls you when you are just resting, doing nothing. That's why it's called default mode <coughs> network, because it is resting. And if you do something in particular, like a, a test, like a talking or writing or singing, then it goes to sleep. So it only acts when you are just listening. Default mode network. Default mode network. And it is made of the singular gyrus which I just mentioned, the medial prefrontal cortex, the medial temporal, the precuneus, and the parietal <coughs> cortex. So it has wide uh, connections. Again, this is corpus callosum. This is singular gyrus. Or singular, and it connects to these areas, the DMA. So from the singular gyrus, we go into the severe frontal gyrus, we go into the gyrus rectus and orbital gyrus, and we go backward to the cuneus and so on. So it connects, that's why it's called uh, resting uh, mood. The same thing here. So, corpus callosum very much related to the cingulum. Cingulum is made of two parts, the dorsal part and the ventral part. This is the tractography that shows you this. This is MRI with the tractography that shows you this in particular. This is a field view that you can see. Look at this beautiful picture. This is tractography. The New MRIs can show you this. So, corpus callosum is in blue. It goes around the singular gyrus. And people talk about no guard. Can't be. Can't be that these fibers are connected by an explosion in the galaxy. There have to be a creation. So, what are the functions of the default mode network? <coughs> Very important. As I said, it functions when you are resting. It's a daydreaming. I'm sure for the Messiah in the surgery. It's a daydreaming. So daydreaming, planning for the future. So you are motivating yourself. So it's most important for motivation how I would reach my goals, keep the decision of my goals. Uh, what do I think about myself? And if I use my and I'm like a slam, thinking about others. 
يقال إن this default mode network is the one responsible for discrimination. I'm afraid of the blacks, or the blacks are afraid of the whites, or whatever. So if you damage this, you will affect the person, his motivation, and his mood, and he will get what we call abulia or a kinetic mutation. Somebody was just sitting there, doing nothing, not moving, does not think, doesn't want to do anything. This is very bad. So let's see about the uh, JVM, which is the butterfly. How do we manage it? This is important, especially in Jordan, especially in the third world countries. Neurosurgeons, and I mean young ones, are taught that you don't need to excise butterfly brain. You just need to take others. And this is criminology <coughs> again, like the shunt. You can't do the pineal tumor, you cannot do the keratin tumor, you put a shunt, bilateral shunt, so what? And the same thing here. Because he does not know what we have said. He does not know the areas of the brain. I tell you, 99% of people who sit for the board exam do not know anything about the brain. They don't know the difference between the frontal or the right and left. So they are taught that we just take a biopsy and move. Why? Because they are afraid of this. A kinetic immutism, a beulia, injury to the head of chodate, injury to the septal nuclei, or injury to the anterior uh, uh, so what is abulia? It is lack of initiation or will. It's complete apathy. It's called akinetic commutism. Also, it is called ectasia abasia. Psychologists know very much about this. I don't know whether Dr. Wilson people are here. So traditionally, your surgeon will go just for biopsy and send them for radio chemotherapy. Another kind. There is nothing called biopsy here, except in very rare cases. Biopsy was made to suit those mediocre surgeons who cannot do the surgery. Radiation is made for those mediocre surgeons who cannot do the surgery. And so we have to know this, that prognostic factors governing the glioma are related to age. The older the patient, the worse the prognosis, yes. Karnowski performance scale. The lower the Karnowski performance scale, the worse the patient. But there is also genetic profile that we will discuss. And this is most important, the extent of resection. If you excise much of the tumor, then you give the patient the best chance. If you take biopsy, you have given him no chance whatsoever. And the criminology about it, that people who do these biopsies, they charge the patient the same amount of money, money that you charge for credit. So there are genetic factors, genetic markers, very well known now to IDH1. This is bad. If it is there, then the tumor is bad. EGFR, the dermal growth factor. MGMT, if it is there, it's better. FEGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor. PTN, MP9, TP53. These are genetic factors. <coughs> this is a great man from Turkey. Mohammed Ghazi Yezajir, he is the man of century of neurosurgery. I know him very well, and he visited Jordan several times. This is with my wife, and this is with his wife. And he is one of the most celebrated neurosurgeons around the world. Long time ago, in the 70s, he believed in radical excision of a tumor. Glioma or no glioma? Radical excision because you will benefit the patient. If you don't know anatomy, if you don't know surgery, if you don't have a good teacher, then you will remain small. This man made a neurosurgery great, and we are great because of him. Let's look at the papers. This is Raymond Sawyer from the States, a friend of mine. He's a good oncologist. What does he say about it? He says, limitations of a stereotactic biopsy. Don't do stereotactic biopsy. And he shows you this. This is the tumor, and this is the surgery. So I'm not talking as a virus, I'm talking about evidence-based medicine, papers that are published there. Still, there are mediocre surgeons who could sit there and say, we will do just biopsy because you have to be safe with the patient. No, you want to work to be safe with yourself, which is a crime. Uh, another paper, 
assessment of outcomes, 2012, 12 biopsies, 12 and even clinical. Survival here after biopsy is 48 days, survival here is 265 days. So this is evidence, clinical is much better than biopsy. <coughs> Giovanni Brugi, again another friend of Jordan, Italian, very clever man, oncologist, 2013, this is the statement. In a dedicated brain cancer surgery center, the maximal safe resection of all the tumors is the standard of care. What is the standard of care in Jordan? Biopsy. And nobody cares. And nobody raise a voice, raise a finger. I will raise my finger until I die, until we expose this mediocre surgery and surgeons. 2014, another paper. There's a plot in here. This is biopsy. They live short. And this is going to be they live better. 48 patients. They were associated with a longer period of time. Mind you, the glioblastoma is a bad disease. So the more days and months you give to the patient, the better. Raymond Sawyer again, 2015. Look what he's saying. Can we do better than a gross total? And then an actor in crystal, the Nishbe Yossi, or any relaxation, did an actor. And how we would do that? By removal of additional portion of the flare abnormality. It doesn't go for the contrast, it goes even for the traces of the tumor on the flare, which means that he's doing extra. And he says this will give patient more time to live. Michael Shigrew, 2017, looked at this default uh, mode network. Look at this. This is the corpus callosum. This is the gyrus. This is the single gyrus. And this is the singular bundles in it. This is the ventricle. This is the head of the cotate. And these are the septic nuclei. If you know this anatomy, then you can remove the corpus callosum tumors without causing the beauty and the kinetic mutism. If you don't, and 99% don't, they will go for biopsy. And they will stand there talking. So this is the corpus callosum, and it is surrounding the cingulum. So if you go here to this area, you will damage this, and you will cause a beulia. You know your anatomy. Once you reach there, you make a, a turn, and then go for the tumor. Now this, this is the cingulum. How many neurosurgeons in Jordan know where is the cingulum, or what is the cingulum? 2018, Mitch Berger. Mitch Berger is the man of glioma in the world. And he published lots of paper. His main work is about gliomas. And look at this. The biopsy and the craniotomy. Overall survival, survival free. It is well documented. Yet somebody would stand and say a biopsy. Oboku, again, this is recent, 2018. There's a major benefit of resection versus biopsy. To nine session, 12 biopsy, different survival time. This is evidence based medicine. Khalas, finished. So, let's present our cases. Two cases to be presented. We'll go through them quickly. This man is from Iraq, 59 year old, male Iraq. Iraq he's, a, he's a doctor, by the way, by profession. Uh, we'll go through very quickly. This is him, his time movements are okay. So he did not have major things except that his legs were a little bit wobbly and he had some headaches. But look at this, his urea was elevated, his sodium was 120. Dangerously low. Dangerously low. Uh, sugar is elevated. And these are his MRIs. A butterfly glioma. But it is not equally distributed. You can say that the right side is more than the left side, which is quite often. You can have the same tumor on both sides. You can have one side more than the other. Still, it is called butterfly glioma. So there you are, in various sequences. And the corona. Syndrome is here. You damage it, you cause problems. So it is a huge tumor. What is the biopsy going to do? Nothing. Even if you give radiotherapy and chemotherapy, it's useless. 
absolute useless, utter useless, because there's a huge role in the tumor. And anybody with just one, two neurons function will tell you that the effect of radiation and chemotherapy is dependent about the volume of the tumor left. Leave a huge amount of the tumor, radiotherapy and chemotherapy will be useless. So it's a game. It's a, it's a mockery. It's a crime. What is the differential diagnosis of this region that we have seen? Very funny. Demyelinating disease. MS loves this corpus sclerosis, and they present like a tumor. This was by mistake. So it's a published paper. I was taken to the editor, and the histology showed demyelinating disease. Another demyelinating disease proven by histology. Lipoma of the corpus callosum. Another disease where there is a lipid uh, uh, deposition in the corpus callosum. So we did a few consultations. Uh, Dr. Nassim is not here as a cardiologist. This is the man, the Iraqi man, as we said. He says cardiology is okay, basically. And Dr. Maurice, again, he is not here. Patient has glioma. Put him on Kibra 500 milligrams, etc. Dr. Malik Ayad is urology because we said the sodium is low, and he found that there is residual volume of urine in his bladder, which he attributed to the uh, enlargement of the prostate. Dr. Khaled Al Asad, as pulmonologist. So it is the global care of the patient. We don't care about how much time and effort that is needed. You need to be absolutely safe. Again, back to the package, which is another crime in medicine. If you take a patient as a package, you will not do anything of this, because you want to save as much money as you can save. Dr. Mohamed Juma, would you like to make comments? Please. Thank you, Dr. Grimes. <coughs> Well, uh, regarding our talk few words about uh, hyponatremia, first of all, uh, we have uh, to look about history, if, any, if the patient is taking diuretic or not. It is very important. If there is no diuretics in the history, you have to look for hypothyroidism and for adrenal insufficiency to exclude these two entities. If both entities are excluded, we must think about inappropriate ADH uh, syndrome uh, secretion. Uh, in such cases, uh, as far as uh, sodium is 120, it is the best approach in his case, is water fluid restriction plus hypertonic line at least to elevate uh, sodium above 130, which is safe. This is I, uh, actually, I think, what the, uh, we did uh, you have to correct, of course, uh, sodium over uh, at least 24 to 48 hours, not immediately to raise sodium from 20, 120 to 140, because you can uh, cause more damage. This is regarding hyponatremia, regarding his diabetes. Uh, already we discussed the best approach, particularly patients on high dose steroids, is to put them on basal bolus insulin, Usually we calculate the dose according to body weight and it is usually we start with at least one minute per kg divided into basal 50% and bolus three dosages 50% and we do usually frequent glucose monitoring to adjust the dose immediately uh, day by day and hour by hour. Thank you. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Firas Abayashi. I'm an anesthesiologist at uh, Farah Medical Campus. Uh, uh, during this, uh, the management of uh, anesthetizing this patient, uh, the most important, uh, there are two uh, important factors regarding this patient. Uh, 
uh, two entities were uh, very uh, alarming in this case. Uh, one was the very high uh, blood sugar, which the patient did not have any previous recollection of his condition. And the other one is the <coughs> severe hyponatremia that he had. So I'll be talking bri very briefly, uh, to just to reiterate what uh, Dr. Mohamed Juma has uh, mentioned, and why hyponatremia uh, per se is extremely important uh, to, to the patients, to the management of, of the patients, and to my uh, fellow colleagues, uh, the anesthesiologists. So disorders of the sodium balance occur in up to 30% of hospitalized uh, patients, which is uh, severely correlated with increased mortality and morbidity in these patients. And in sodium homeostasis, just very briefly as an introduction, the normal level is 134 to 146 millimole per liter. And the sodium is a major determinant of the uh, serum osmolality, normally between 280 and 295 milliosmol per liter. Just briefly about the sodium uh, regulation and how our, our body handles the uh, sodium. So if there is a decreased uh, sodium uh, concentration, the, uh, the renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone uh, pathway is activated uh, just to uh, raise the body sodium to normal. And if the sodium concentration is elevated, uh, the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus senses that and then activate the antidiuretic uh, hormone. In addition to that, the atrial metriuretic peptide plays a very important role uh, in uh, excreting uh, sodium and uh, regulating uh, the uh, uh, sodium levels back to normal. What about the classifications? Many classifications have been mentioned uh, in the books. Uh, it goes, um, is, it's a spectrum from mild to severe disease. Uh, but uh, severe disease is when we have uh, sodium levels below 125 millimole per liter. <coughs> Briefly again about the etiology of hyponatremia is divided into uh, three major classes. The first one is gaining uh, water in isolation. And this is very important because mostly it's iatrogenic, especially when we use dextrose uh, solutions. And when we have patients with the uh, syndrome of an appropriate uh, ADH secretion. And the second class is gaining water to a greater extent more than uh, gaining sodium. Uh, these, this is very important in patients with liver failure and congestive uh, cardiac failure. The third class is uh, sodium depletion to a greater extent than that of water, which can be divided further into renal and uh, non-renal causes. The renal, most importantly, uh, especially related to neurosurgical disorders, the cerebral salt wasting syndrome, which is mostly associated with traumatic brain injury and brain tumors, and the non-renal, which uh, many causes can cause that. So uh, regarding our case, what about hyponatremia and tumor-related uh, conditions? About 14% of uh, hyponatremic patients uh, in patient uh, uh, population is due to underlying tumor-related conditions. Uh, the, uh, the mechanism behind that has been divided into uh, four major classes, uh, 1A through uh, 2B. First is the excess of uh, ADH hormone and then the excess uh, intake of free water, uh, renal solute conservation and renal solute loss. What about uh, symptoms and signs of hyponatremia? The symptoms and signs associated with hyponatremia are related to uh, two major categories, the degree of the imbalance and then the speed at which the imbalance uh, have occurred. So time is an essence for, uh, uh, with the signs and symptoms and severity of the signs and symptoms in these patients. Slowly develop, uh, evolving hyponatremia is frequently <coughs> asymptomatic. This is as opposed to uh, acute hyponatremia. Patients in whom acute severe hyponatremia has developed in under 48 hours can present with very alarming signs and symptoms such as coma and convulsions. Additionally, they are at risk of death as a result of cerebral herniation. This is due to brain edema. And certain groups are very much at risk, higher risk than other uh, uh, populations, such as children, hypoxic patients, premenopausal women, are all at increased risk of developing uh, cerebral edema. 
Uh, very briefly, as Dr. Mohamed Juma uh, has mentioned, uh, in terms of management, now the current guidelines uh, um, recommend that uh, four to six millimole uh, per liter uh, increase it should be done within 24 hours, and 12 to 14 millimole uh, per liter as a maximum in 48 hours, or 14 to 16 millimole per liter in 72 hours. So rapid correction is an absolute contraindication in these patients. And in moderate to severe cases, this requires blood sampling every one to two hours, and these patients should be taken care of in the uh, intensive care unit. Um, now, 0.9% saline is the mainstay of treatment. Uh, the reason I mentioned 0.9% saline, because usually people call it normal saline, and it's absolutely not normal. So normal saline, uh, by evidence-based medicine, is absolutely not normal because the concentration of sodium is 150 mol per liter and then it, ca it might cause severe hyperchloromic metabolic acidosis according to the Stewart theory. So Hartman solutions uh, can be used in, uh, in cases of hyperchloremia instead of 0.9% normal saline. So 3% uh, normal saline, uh, sorry, 3% saline should be reserved for those patients with severe neurological compromise, such as in cases of seizures and coma. The major risk associated with ex excessively rapid sodium correction is what is called osmotic demyelination, especially point-time osmotic demyelination. And certain patient groups, which we should be aware of when we are correcting the sodium levels, uh, are more prone than other patients to uh, osmotic demyelination. These patients are the malnourished, malnourished patients, alcoholics, and burned <coughs> patients are those patients with severe <coughs> hypokalemia. So just uh, a few take home messages. Um, hyponatremia is the most commonly encountered electrolyte disturbance uh, encountered in uh, inpatient population. And the diagnosis may be incidental, such as uh, uh, preoperative evaluation. That's exactly what happened in this patient. And endocrinologists should be consulted to guide the investigation and the management. And acute hyponatremia can cause uh, severe cerebral edema, coma and seizures, and uh, brain herniation. And over rapid correction of hyponatremia uh, would risk the patients to myelinolysis and uh, the sodium should be carefully controlled with no more than 46 millimoles per liter per 24 hours. And thank you very much. I have a comment. Please. It's very important when you see patients with hyponatremia as a lab director, you have to know when the test was done after it was withdrawn from the patient blood. Because as a lab director, we sometimes encounter that the uh, or sodium imbalance is out of order, so we have to send it to another lab. And uh, if you have more than one hour delay, you will get hyponatremia artificial. So be careful. When you send, when you take some blood, you have to make sure that there is no delay in performing a, a, a sodium test. Because the so if you spread the blood and you can send more than one hour, you get hyponatremia in all cases. So because so the consequences of correcting it is bad. Uh, when the patient is really not hyponatremic but falsely hyponatremic, make sure that everything went okay all the way. Okay. <coughs> uh, another thing, I yes. would, uh, uh, Dr. Awaish uh, uh, stressed that, that a lot of patients actually with heart failure who are in diuretics because it is a chronic hyponatremia, even I, a lot of patients you can see with sodium 110 and they are free without any symptoms because it is a chronic hyponatremia due to chronic use of diuretics. Therefore, the symptoms usually occur if it is acute drop in sodium, then you feel a lot of symptoms. Again, I have to mention that sodium was 110 or 115 can cause death. Sodium 170 can cause death. And if I look, and I looked into the practice of surgery on the pituitary gland, or on craniopharyngiomas, because they are near the hypothalamus. The surgeon usually goes for a shunt, but he, if he is clever enough, he may go for surgery. And surgery ends at the end of the surgery, and nobody cares about surgery. That's why 99% of the craniopharyngioma surgery end in death due to hyponatremia. So, 
We took this way to the theater and we use navigation because we are dealing with very important structures. We mind the navigation now. Uh, we use this machine and we make, basically, if somebody doesn't know about navigation, we make something called navigation MRI before surgery. And this navigation MRI comes on a CD and the CD puts into the machine and then we confirm the points that if I put my pointer here, I will see it here on the head of the patient. So we do 100% matching to make sure, and we do this kind of map to make sure that that is corresponding. And look at this. That if you're in surgery, I know where exactly I am. I want to avoid this. I want to avoid this singular. Right? I can do this with general anesthesia. I can do it with, with awake anesthesia, awake, anesthesia awake, awake surgery. Awake surgery has its own limitations and dangers. I don't like it. I use it under GA. I know exactly where I am. I know my anatomy. So I know this point, I'm here. I'm here. And so on. So that is very helpful in this kind of surgery. At the end of the day, if my imagination is different from the machine, I take my imagination and I forget about the machine. So let's look at the surgery. The machine is a ball. The navigator is a probe, you put it? It's a probe, but it is, it's a machine where you have put the MRI that you have done before into the machine. So the machine has the MRI of the patient. And then you take these markers and put them into the machine so the machine will correlate both. And then you make, okay, now let's make sure. This is the tip of the nose, this is the ear, this is midline. So you make sure that you are on the right side. Right. If there is major difference, you ignore it. I hope one day you can explain it with more photos. Sure, sure, I will. I will. Yeah. Next case. So this is the surgery. As you know that the tumor is more on one side, so we'll go on one side. If it is bilaterally distributed equally, then we'll go both sides. You can see the brain edema here. The brain is bulging because severe edema is there. And we can immediately look at this color, yellowish color, different from the color of the brain. I know that this is a tumor because I know the consistency of the brain. I know how the sucker feels on the brain, how the sucker feels on the tumor. Here we're sending good samples for frozen section. I don't use any sample with diathermy on it, because that would mislead the, the uh, histopathologist. And I know of neurosurgeons who intentionally put the diathermy on the pieces because he was not where the tumor is. So he just wanted to confuse the histopathologist. Again, you can see the difference. We know where we are. This is midline. And here some CSF is coming out, so I'm approaching to the ventricle. I have to have this 3D anatomy knowledge to go there, otherwise I don't. So this is all tumor. And we have to remove as much as we can, because when we want to send this patient for radiotherapy or chemotherapy, then a small amount of the tumor is left. And radiotherapy and chemotherapy will be successful. Look at this necrotic tumor. So by the naked eye, you can tell that this is a tumor. And I want to go into the ventricle. Now I am in the ventricle. I should know that the caudate nucleus is here. This is the head of the nucleus here. And here is medially. So this is here. I'm approaching the single. I have to be careful. So I know where the frontal horn of the ventricle. I go around it. The idea is to remove the tumor without affecting any of these areas that we have mentioned, the default uh, mode networks. Still tumor. What would the biopsy do? It would do nothing. It's good for the money in the pocket of the surgeon, a false surgeon, a mediocre surgeon, who would put the same amount of mon money and take the biopsy as you put on the... This is the head of codate, and you can tell the color head of codate is different from the ependema of the ventricle. So you will all want to preserve the codate nucleus, you preserve the cingulum, and you have removed as much as you could of the tumor. So glioma or no glioma, biopsy is forbidden. You should go for radical excision of the patient. Biopsy was made by a mediocre surgeon.
the tumor actually was mo most of the tumor 95 percent was necrotic tumor and necrosis is really bad in tumor pathology and once you see necrosis uh, you know that uh, you have a uh, bad tumor is a sign of with the and uh, there was some procedure that have viable tumor uh, so it is very similar i can see the tumor is very very similar all these dots are cells and indicate there are cells and there's vascular progression, the tumor. Uh, you can see how similar is the tumor. There's mitosis. There was mitosis three behind power field, uh, ten high power field, and this is vascular progression uh, in the tumor. And this is the necrotic areas. Most of the tumor is necrotic. Uh, this is mitotic figure. I put arrow in it. Uh, and this is the vascular endothelial progression. I put an arrow. Typical vascular endothelial perforation, the cells look like glomerulus. That's why it's called glomeruloid perforation of blood vessels. And you can see uh, how cellular is the tumor, hyperchromatic. The tumor cells are not evenly distributed. And uh, this is usual in uh, gliomas. Uh, we did uh, immune staining, uh, endothelial membrane antigen is negative in these tumors. Uh, we did it because to exclude many things. Part of it is not to be meningioma, a typical high grade meningioma, not to be metastatic carcinoma. JFEB is positive. You can see the brown is the positive staining. And clearly, all these spindle things are, are positive staining. JFEB this is typical in glioma. Uh, IDH1 is very important to do IDH1 in all glioma tumors. Uh, IDH1 negative tumors, they usually do worse than IDH1 positive tumors. IDH1 negative, as this in, in this case, Usually they are primary, uh, primary glioblastoma, and they, they do worse than secondary glioblastoma. Secondary glioblastoma usually uh, like in uh, grade two and grade three that transform into grade four. Uh, this is what, what we call secondary glioblastoma. They usually are the H1 positive in adults, not in uh, under breast in children. And they are, when they are positive, and you know that they are, uh, they do better in that in negative. And usually when they are positive, IDH1 usually, not always, negative IDH1, B53 will be negative because they are the same pathway. And when they are positive, you, uh, they are, uh, uh, B53 will be uh, positive. K67 was very high. You can see all these black or uh, uh, dark brown spots are K67. And you can see how much they are it's estimated 27%. And this is very high for uh, glioma. But this, this is the glioblastoma multiformity. A high grade B53 was negative because IDH1 was negative. You expected uh, if you go inside with the glioblastoma or astrocytomas. So this is a glioblastoma multiform WHA grade four. Okay. 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 We're talking about the butterfly gliomas. So. Uh, just to go back to the KI-67, up to 4% is normal tumor, benign tumor, from 4 to 10 is medium, above 10% is usually malignant. So you walk up on the table, you should not leave without being awake, fully awake, and this is the post -op. We have done a good job. We have a good amount of the tumor. Then we can send them for radiotherapy and keep them. Other than this, it is a crime, and we have to fight crime. Did you do the left side? No, because it's mainly on the right side. So I went this way, you can see it. I've reached this point. If it is the same thing on both sides, like we will see in the next case, then I go both sides. <coughs> I published a paper some time ago, and I called it, Do We Need a Neurosurgical Interpol? And we really do, to capture those mediocre surgeons. You can see that we have a good deal of the tumor. 
So it is not just somebody who's saying anything. It is based evidence medicine. Because why I do this? I do this the following morning. Why I do this? It's for me. It's for the patient, for the family, and for the residents to teach them the right thing. And this is the patient. He is very well. No abuse, no any technicism. We have given him the good chance. Whether he would live for a year or three years, it's up to God, not to me. But I have done my job. So he was sent for radio and chemotherapy. And this is his discharge summary, which is detailed one. Otherwise, it is not a discharge summary. Everything that should be written there. Second case is 42-year-old male Jordanian patient who lives in Canada. And he opted to come to Jordan. He's married to, he's Jordanian, but living in Canada with a Canadian passport. He's married to a lady from Jordan. And just before presenting, his wife was pregnant and she gave birth just before surgery. That's him. Again, headaches, wobbly legs, imbalance. And this is the tumor, the bilateral, okay? So both sides are affected. But you can see that this side is affected more than this side because of the contrast in massing more on the left than on the right. More on the left than on the right. What a biopsy would do in this case? Nothing. Having said that, and you're a surgeon, and a man, volunteered and did a good work for him, and took a biopsy, and took a good amount of money. It cost him about 30 minutes. He went out, no complications, patient is away, because he has done nothing. And the surgery was associated on a grade three, go for radiotherapy and chemotherapy with confidence. Mediocre surgeons, they have confidence. Tumor is there. We did consultations. Again, the tumor is the same because of the uh, possibility of epilepsy in this patient, patients. And we did very much important topic, which is the psychiatric consultation. We did not do it for the first patient because his wife is a doctor, she refused. Iraqi mentality means that if we ask for the psychiatry, then the husband is fool or mad. Uh, this patient is because he was raised in Canada, he accepted it, him and his wife. So Dr. Melissa handed full uh, uh, psychological assessment, which was done before and after surgery. And I keep repeating that we are one among very few centers around the world who do this before surgery. Victor for us, uh, seen him, and he went for surgery. This is our constant form, and I wrote it in English because he does not read Arabic. So I put it in English, and it was easy for me because I just copied the form that we used in London back in the 80s. I have been told, and I understand this statement, that I have to read it it's very important, these kind of statements. <coughs> and the assessment, what is the aim, etc., etc. We have to be very careful. So uh, again, we use the navigation. <coughs> the same machine. Yeah. I say the Ziyad Sala, very good machine. Okay. And again, I started with the left side, because it is the more contrast and unseen. Again, with the use of this, this is the cross, so I know where I am. I am just below the corpus callosum. Single gyrus is there, so I'm avoiding single gyrus. So you keep pointing these, you know exactly where you are. So we started on the left side, and this is temperature, I don't want to show more videos, but this is the left side, and then we went to the right side, and again concentrated on the... It's temporal, no? Sorry? It's temporal, no? No, no, it's completely in the front of here. Mm. Here we are in the, in the within the corpusum. <coughs> That's not the top one. So we went to the other side and did it. So this is the midline. We opened the uh, left side and the right side. I'm 
what will come from to report the surges? The same thing like the one before. GFAP, IDH1, KI67, 6%, it is less than the previous patient. P53, Sinat2, Tyson, and again it is JBM. What's the difference? We have done a good job for the patient. Also, he woke up on table, 15 over 15, no problem. And this is the evidence of how much we removed of the tumor without causing any damage. This is his discharge summary. Again, we sent him for chemo radiotherapy with the confidence that we have given him the best chance possible. This is immediate post op. And this is when he came for the clinic. Okay, that finished with any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions, any comments? Sorry for the delay. For the meeting, you know the meeting. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, the, the typical teaching for butterfly is this big lyoma and lymphoma. But I want for the new generation now, in the era of immunocompromised patients, the drug addict, now, a typical infections on the brain, the abscesses, they are taking the shape of butterfly appearance. So, very important for you to know is he immunocompetent or not for the patient. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> this is very important because, again, in Jordan and in this part of the world, people know just two words about anything. Cellular region is pituitary. Fourth ventricular tumor is the stomach. No, the differential diagnosis is very wide. And Dr. Hadidi added two things which are important, especially in our immunocompromised era. There are lots of AIDS, lots of immunocompromisation, and uh, people would come with lymphoma, or the system with the, uh, toxoplasmosis, or when, uh, I can tell you that we are seeing these cases. But people don't think about it, because uh, doctors in this part of the world, they live on a very small amount of knowledge. And they just practice on a very small amount of knowledge. They don't teach themselves, nobody teaches them. So if he's graduated as such, he will remain as such for the rest of his life for 50 years. Any other questions? Uh, I may sound very harsh and criticizing my colleagues. I tell you, I'm very happy to do that. My conscience is clear that I am exposing those mediocre surgeons who should not be left to practice their crimes on human beings. Lots of malpractice. Nobody is raising a finger. I will continue to raise my finger and raise my foot in the face of these people until the day I die. Thank you very much. Yes, I can.